In my last lecture, I tried to explain the philosophy of Ludwig Wittgenstein. Firstly, I told you something about his life and works, and the most important thing was that his philosophy might be divided into two phases that are usually called Wittgenstein I and Wittgenstein II. In the first phase, he was interested in ideal language philosophy, but then he changed his mind and aimed at ordinary language philosophy. And I also told you something about his first important book, that was Tractatus Logica Philosophicus. I explained his picture theory of language, and I also uh, talked about the demarcation project between sensical and nonsensical parts of language. In this lecture, I'm going to continue with this topic because I'm going to uh, talk about Wittgenstein's second phase and about his theory of language games. Wittgenstein's second book was called Philosophical Investigations, and it was written from 1930s to 1950s. It was published posthumously because Wittgenstein died in 1951 and the book saw the light of the world in 1953. The style of writing is completely different than Tractatus. Tractatus was a set of hierarchically numbered statements that were, according to Wittgenstein, self-evident. This book, Philosophical Investigations, has a style of a fictitious or inner dialogue. It again has numbered paragraphs, but the paragraphs are much longer than in Tractatus. Tractatus made impression that it has answered all the questions philosophers had. Investigations asked questions without finding answers to them. It means that Wittgenstein wasn't as sure about his solutions than in Tractatus. The other difference between Tractatus and Investigations was in the topic of both books. In Philosophical Investigations, Wittgenstein gave up construction of an ideal language. His ambition was now to describe how a natural language works. To quote from um, Philosophical Investigations from paragraph 124. Philosophy must not interfere in any way with the actual use of language, so it can in the end only describe it. For it cannot justify it either. It leaves everything as it is." Unquote. This approach, as you can see, is very different from earlier Wittgenstein's writings, because he doesn't want to reform or change anything. He just wants, he just wants to describe how languages works how our mother tongues works. So he's interested in a natural language or ordinary language now. There was a reason behind this change of mind. Wittgenstein abandoned picture theory of language that he presented in Tractatus because he saw that it was not complete. He understood finally that picture theory of language dealt with declarative sentences only. Tractatus left this problem unsolved, uh, and Wittgenstein finally asked, what is the meaning of other sentences like interrogative, exclamatory, and imperative ones? And what about wishes, promises, warnings, greetings, jokes, insult, etc. According to Wittgenstein, these sentences do not picture any facts because they do not refer to any realities. Uh, they have some another role in our language and Wittgenstein wanted to find out what the role was and how these sentences got their meanings. So I will give you some examples of sentences that were not dealt with in a picture theory of language. 
For example, I am your father is a declarative sentence. So I think that picture theory of language is okay in this case. But you talking to me is a question. It doesn't denote an effect. So picture theory of this sentence is pointless. Call me Ishmael. It's a wish or maybe a interrogative. Again, no fact there. May the force be with you is a wish again. So we cannot find an effect in the real material world that this sentence refers to. And the last one is an insult. You son of a motherless goat. You can clearly see that Wittgenstein's theory from, take, uh, from Tractatus is again toothless here. In a philosophical investigations, Wittgenstein came to a conclusion that we cannot find a reference for every phrase, because some phrases do not refer to anything real. According to later Wittgenstein, we can only describe its use in a linguistic community, and I stress out the term use. This is what Wittgenstein's approach to language is based on, use. So we can say that it's some kind of pragmatic approach to language that deals with a context of every sentence or every phrase. This was the reason why Wittgenstein invented the term language game. According to Wittgenstein, the language is based on many and many language games. A language game is a practice when a speaker is trying to communicate meaning for various reasons. You can see that this definition of a language game is very vague because Wittgenstein understood that it is a very general term. We use the term a language game for describing anything that happens in language. In Paragraph 23 of Philosophical Investigations, Wittgenstein wrote, the word language game is used here to emphasize the fact that the speaking of language is part of an activity or of a form of life. Later, he wanted to give us a more precise definition. And that's why he wrote in paragraph 67, I can think of no better expression to characterize these similarities than family resemblances. For the various resemblances between members of a family are built, features, color of eyes, gait, temperament, and so on and so forth, overlap and crisscross in the same way. And I shall say games for a family. To understand Wittgenstein's concept of family resemblance, you can have a look at this picture that is from the time when Wittgenstein lived and there is some mm, unknown family. You can clearly see at this picture that the members of this family are not the same. There are huge differences in their body build and in their faces. But you can also see that there might be some small resemblances between two of these members. So you can say that father has the same eyes as his son in the middle of the picture, or that mother has the same chin as a young girl uh, in the lower part of this photograph, and so on and so on. And this is according to Wittgenstein, the only thing we can do with any um, varied group of members of family or language because there is nothing common for all of these cases. There are just smaller resemblances um, among smaller sets of its members. To give you an idea of what Wittgenstein meant when he was talking about language games, let me read you this short sample. And this is a list of various language games that exist in uh, natural languages. Uh, giving orders and acting on them. 
Describing an object by its appearance or by its measurements. Constructing an object from a description, for example a drawing. Reporting an event. Speculating about the event. Forming and testing a hypothesis. Presenting the results of an experiment in tables and diagrams. Making up a story and reading one. Acting in a play. Singing rounds. Guessing riddles. Cracking a joke. Telling one. Solving a problem in applied arithmetic. Translating from one language into another. Requesting, thanking, cursing, greeting, praying. And so on and so on. The list could go at infinitum. The point is that if all of these cases are really language games, our theory of language must be very general one to explain how all these instances work and how can actors and users of natural languages use them. When Wittgenstein was trying to explain how language works, he usually used the term rule following. That's because, according to Wittgenstein, using a language is like playing a game, for example, chess. In the beginning, you give meaning to pieces of the game. For example, you say, this is the king, this is the knight, this is the rook, this is the pawn, and so on. And then you have to follow the rules to play successfully. You can understand that this is just a metaphor of how language works, according to Wittgenstein, because in the beginning we have to give meanings to our words, to those sounds we use. And then we have to follow the rules of grammar to play successfully, which means to communicate in a successful way. So, the point of Wittgenstein's theory of language in his philosophical investigation is that language does not picture the world. It is just a set of all possible language games we play during our lives. From all of this results a very important finding, according to Wittgenstein, which deals about the possibility of private language. According to Wittgenstein, rules of any language must be public by definition. It means that there cannot be anything like private language. There cannot be a language that is used just by one person, because its rules wouldn't be public. Uh, no one would understand what this language means, and the aim of any language is to communicate meaning. The impossibility of private language had again some important consequences, because later philosophers and psychologists talked about the impossibility of language of thought, or so-called mentalese. This is some kind of language our ideas are formed in, and that has nothing to do with that public language we learn when we are small kids. When we follow Wittgenstein's approach, there cannot be anything like that, because this mentalese, this language of thought, wouldn't be a language at all. Wittgenstein created a very famous thought experiment that is called a beetle in a box. Thought experiment is a philosophical device. It's a part of philosophical methodology when you imagine some unreal scenario and you are trying to say something about the real world. Um, I will read a part from the paragraph 293 from Philosophical Investigations, but it might be a bit complicated. So this is the reason why I heavily recommend a video uh, you can see the link here. It's say from a BBC series on philosophy, and I hope you would understand better if you watch it. It takes just a few minutes. Uh, this is a sample of two pages from Philosophical Investigations I gave you as a required read-in. And the important part, as I said, is this 
um, paragraph 293, and I will read a part of it. It starts in second paragraph. Suppose that everyone had a box with something in it which we call a beetle. No one can ever look into anyone else's box, and everyone says he knows what a beetle is only by looking at his beetle. Here it would be quite possible for everyone to have something different in his box. One might even imagine such a thing constantly changing. But what if these people's word beetle had a use nonetheless? If so, it would not be as the name of a thin. The thin in the box doesn't belong to the language game at all, not even as a something, for the box might even be empty. No, one can divide through by the thing in the box. It cancels out whatever it is. This is to say, if we construe the grammar of the expression of sensation on the model of object and name, the object drops out of consideration as irrelevant. What Wittgenstein wanted to say in his example is that it doesn't matter what you have in your minds when we are analyzing language games. We cannot see into heads of other people, so we can only presume that they have the same ideas as we have. But it might not be the case, because sometimes our ideas in our heads differ, but the words are still the same. I gave you three questions for this required reading, and I hope that you will read the text again and watch the BBC video, and you will be able to answer them. The first one is, how we know what the word pain means? Second, explain the thought experiment of a beetle in a box, I mean in your own words. And the third one is, do we need objects to understand words? Please try to think about that. I believe that Wittgenstein's thought experiment of a beetle in a box is very important for philosophers of language, psychologists, and linguists too. It's because Wittgenstein's rejection of the possibility of private language was the beginning of a dispute on the origin of the human language faculty. We have two approaches to this problem, and they are usually called behaviorism and nativism. Let's start with behaviorism. The origins of behaviorism come from psychology, from, from psychologists as J.B. Watson or Berhus Skinner, but the main proponent of behaviorism in philosophy of language was Willard van Ormen Quine. I'm going to talk about this guy a lot later in my lectures. According to Quine and many others, we are born as tabula rasa, which is a Latin term for white paper, white sheet of paper or a blank slate. According to behaviorists, we learn language based on ostension and behavioral stimuli. Ostension means pointing fingers and uttering terms. When I point a finger at a chair and I utter a term, a chair, this is an ostension. And according to Quine and behaviorists, this is enough for language acquisition. Nativists present a very different picture of uh, language acquisition because it deals with some innate knowledge. Behaviorists are strongly against the possibility of innate knowledge. Nativism has its main proponent in linguist Noam Chomsky. According to Chomsky, our general linguistic competence is in it, and it includes universal grammar. During language acquisition, we associate eternal language, that Chomsky calls I language, with external languages, E language, in Chomsky's terms. It means that we have to have some in it language to understand the natural one, and without some in it stuff we have in our minds when we are born that was hardwired probably by evolution in our minds, mm, we wouldn't be able to be linguistic beings. I think that this dispute is still 
very hot in linguistics and we are going to discuss it i hope in our online meeting and definitely i'm going to talk about it in my later lectures